Good day, and so I just wanted to say <clears throat> welcome, and thank you for having me in your places, and I also want to send out my greetings and a happy Father's Day to all the dads out there uh, as we celebrate here uh, uh, Father's Day. Uh, today we're coming to the end of our sermon series, so um, you can expect that uh, starting next week we'll be in focusing in other areas of the scripture, the Bible. Uh, we're not sure what to call it yet. During the summer, uh, we've sort of taken a break from going maybe through a whole book or a whole letter. And we'll see what comes of it in the next few days. So just pay, pay, pay attention, pay a look for that in, in the upcoming uh, summer uh, months. Just want to begin by uh, sharing some uh, things I found out on Bridge Masters Inc.com in one of their articles written back in 2017 which gives the, the reader what they would suggest are nine common reasons for bridge failures. This, so today I just wanted to look at one of those and what they would suggest is a number one reason which is not just one particular specific reason but a number or a combination of factors that would cause a bridge to fail. And one of the examples they have in their article is the I-35 uh, Mississippi River Bridge in Minneapolis, pardon me. And this uh, bridge, the I-35 over the Mississippi River, collapsed in August of 2007, which resulted in about 111 vehicles, according to the information I have, uh, 111 vehicles damaged or written off, about 98 people uh, needing hospital care, and 13 uh, tragic deaths through this collapse. So what happened? Well, after months of investigations, the primary cause was identified as the gusset plates. Uh, these gusset plates were found to be a half inch too thin, and over time, uh, they tore along the rivet lines. So these gusset plates are these smaller sheets of steel that are added to joints and pillars and beams in a bridge for reinforcement. And these have stood the test of time for 40 years, that is until August the 1st, 2001, when the bridge collapsed. And the article highlights what they offer up as two additional factors that were present on the day of the collapse. On the day of collapse, uh, heavy construction equipment had been lined up across the bridge as they were doing to do some construction. Secondly, the necessary uh, bridge inspection by qualified bridge inspectors was not carried out. If it had been, in all likelihood, the failing gusset plates would have been discovered and the bridge closed. So what were the factors causing this bridge to collapse after 40 years? Well, there was the failing gusset supports, there was a heavy construction company, and the absence of a proper bridge inspection for the construction. And I think we could add another one just there. The, a fourth one is that this bridge, according to the stats, uh, at that time about 140,000 or so vehicles crossing daily across the Mississippi River over the I-35 bridge. Now, author and uh, author Marshall Segal in an article uses the same very I-35 uh, bridge failure as an illustration in his article. Uh, for he would often cross over living in that area. And he said this after it had been repaired. My drives over the I-35 bridge, likely one of the strongest, most inspected bridges in the world, also helped me feel the preciousness of the church. And, and Segal's thesis, thesis pardon me, follows as this, that the church, ordained by God, was created by God to be the pillar of truth. The pillar of truth. And he illustrates this uh, thesis by comparing the now strong and secure pillar that holds up the I-35 bridge under tremendous pressures to the pillars of the church. The Apostle Paul said to Pastor Timothy in this very letter that we've been studying in chapter 3, although I hope to come to you soon, I'm writing you these instructions so that if I am delayed, you will know how people ought to conduct themselves in God's household, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and foundation of the truth. 
Well, with this in mind, let's turn to uh, 1 Timothy chapter 6. And as we finish off the sixth chapter and letter and our sermon series, starting in verse 17 to the end. Verse 17. Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. In this way, they will lay up treasures for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age, so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. Verse 20, Timothy, guard what has been entrusted to your care. Turn away from godless chatter and the opposing ideas of, of what is falsely called knowledge, which some have professed, and in doing so have departed from the faith. Paul concludes this by saying, grace be with you all. The Lord bless the reading of his word. Let us pray. Oh, Lord, we just thank you so much for your word. And as we now spend some time in these last uh, verses, we thank you for the blessing it has been to go through this over a period of many months, this whole letter. The challenges to us, the challenges not only to us personally, but as a church and into our culture as well. We just thank you, Lord, for your goodness and kindness and ask by your Holy Spirit that you would help us understand the message that you have for us today from your very word. We praise you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as I mentioned, we have arrived at the very completion, at the completion of our sermon series, What is a Church? And it began back in, in early November in the first week, and along the way we've had some pauses with Advent and Christmas and things such as that. But here we are in these last verses of Paul's letter. And it's been a really great blessing for me as I studied and prepared through all this and spent a lot of time in this letter and in the Bible as a whole. I think it's come with some challenges to me, as it probably did to you, and maybe some surprises. A believer, as a believers of Christ, as followers of Christ, we, we are always challenged by God's word in one way or another and tested by the truth of that very word as well which is good for us. It's good for our discipline. It's good for our lives. It's good for our witness in this world. So with all that keeping in mind, I've also hope you've been encouraged as I have in these days as well, especially over the last six or seven months. Also, I have, and I hope you have as well, have grown in your faith and knowledge and the understanding of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And as the Word of God is, uh, washes over us, it, 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 by the power of the Holy Spirit I have, and I hope you have as well, been brought to a greater awe and praise of the God who loves us and has saved us and calls us his dearly loved children and revealed himself uh, and his will for you and me in the pages of his Bible. Um, God is not hiding. He's right here. We can, we can hear from him in the page of his Bible. So let's begin to dig in these last few verses of this letter. If you look at the, the, ladder, at the letter as a whole, uh, it is really a letter of contrasts. For example, uh, one of the main features of this letter is dealing with false teachers in Ephesus. And we have that contrast there, the false teachers and their followers chasing after myths and controversies, quibbling over words and offering another gospel contrasted with the true believers who pursue godliness and righteousness. Uh, for those who have put their hope in the living God, as Paul calls it, and their Savior. We have those who have shipwrecked their faith, who have turned away from the truth, and, for the, and those who have taken hold of eternal life and run that race to win the crown that lasts. So these contrasts are throughout the letter. Now here, as we look at verse 17, Paul now returns to the topic of rich people, which he already talked about earlier in this chapter, and we went through that already. And we know that he identified one of the clear characteristics that we can see even in our day throughout Christian history. One of the clear uh, characteristics of a false teacher and those that follow them is greed. And the scripture describes such people as those that have these corrupt minds who have been robbed of the truth. This is the scripture speaking and who think that godliness is a means to financial gain. So the contrast here in this letter, then, is the true believers 
Uh, who, according to verse 6, uh, understands that godliness with contentment is great gain. If you remember the contrast uh, uh, what I'm going to offer you now, that wealthy man who wanted to take all his money with him when he died and put it in the casket, and his wife, his widow, uh, put this money in the, her bank account, wrote him a check, and placed it in the casket. The contrast here is the true believer knows that, as Paul said here in verse 7, we brought nothing into the world, and we take nothing out of, the, out of it, but if we have food, clothing, and shelter, we will be content, content with that. With this in mind, Paul said now to Timothy, and through Timothy to the church in Ephesus, and through that to us, command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant. Paul here is talking about rich believers. Now we need to remember the church at Ephesus was a multi-generational church. All age groups were represented. And also all pe people from varying strata of the culture around them. There's the rich, the poor, slaves and slave owners, former pagans, atheists, and even former followers of Judaism. Paul here, as I mentioned, was addressing believers who were wealthy in the church. So let me ask you this question. When you think about rich people in our culture, what is the first thought that pops into your mind? And as you ponder that question, uh, let me offer you some perspective in our context, that is those of us who live in what can be described uh, as a first world democratic country, we are viewed by many in the world, a large percentage of the world, as the haves. And if we were to be transported back to the first century Ephesian church in Ephesus, we would be considered the haves. We'd be those that are rich in the church. So what was the first thought that came into your mind? Whatever your thought was, or whatever you think about those with wealth, what we need to understand is what the Bible teaches about wealth and those who have it. Paul said to the rich believers, don't be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain. Why? Well, we already know that the main thrust for a true believer is what? Godliness with contentment, which Paul calls great gain. This kind of gain that Paul is talking about is a result of the believer putting their hope, as Paul said, in the living God who is the Savior. And Paul also said about this kind of gain that it has value for all things, holding promise both for the present life and the life to come. This is really good gain. We have it for this life and the life to come. See, what Paul is not saying here is that wealth is evil. We have many in our culture today saying that wealth is evil. Paul's not saying that because those who have wealth aren't necessarily evil. See, the Bible doesn't teach this. For sure, those who preach another gospel for wealth or profit, I would say they are evil because they cause many to stumble and live in a bondage to their sinful desires, chasing after these things that keep them from having a real life with God. And it's their arrogance and their pride which are manifested with a corrupt mind. And false teachers in to, back then and in today's evangelical world and the world in general and the like, those that believe what they preach and follow that prescription, they all move together in one direction only. That's the only way they move, and that is to attain what is desirable to the sinful flesh. It's things like money and fame and power. Uh, you know, a good life. 50 ways to live a better life today. All that sort of stuff. It's really about self. And the three things of self are simply this, me, myself, and I, that are proclaimed and promoted, not only in our culture, but in many, relig in many churches these days. Paul would say about these kinds of things, these kinds of people with corrupt minds, he would call them, as he said in the second letter to Timothy, he said, while evildoers and imposters go from bad to worse, Deceiving and being deceived. They're deceiving and they're being deceived. 
The wisdom of Proverbs really gives us a great perspective on wealth. Proverbs tells us, do not wear yourself out to get rich. Do not trust your own cleverness. Clever, cleverness. I got that. Cast but a glance at riches and they are gone, for they will surely sprout wings and fly off to the sky like an eagle. Very wise thing to remember. We go to Luke's Gospel, and there we have the parable in chapter 12, the parable of the rich fool. One day, someone went up to Jesus and said to him, or asked him this question, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. We don't have time to go into the context and what would happen with all that, but this is what Jesus said to this person. Man, who appointed me a judge or an arbitrary, arbiter, arbiter between you? He said, watch out. Be on guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. And then Jesus told this parable. There was this rich man, this rich farmer, who had a great harvest one year. Phenomenal harvest. And thinking to himself, what was he to do with such a great harvest? He said, I will build bigger barns for the surplus. Kind of makes common sense, right? Because he said, I have enough grain for years to come. And then he said this. It's time to take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. And God said to him in this parable, God said to him, you fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourselves? This is how it will be with whoever stores things up for themselves, but is not rich toward God. God doesn't need your money, but he wants your heart. This reminded me as we were going, as I was preparing this about growing up in Jasper and days long past, many years ago. And in that community, um, there was a very large Italian community, which our family was part of. My parents had immigrated from Italy. We did things together as a, as a, in a cultural sort of sense of way. We went to church together. We mixed and mingled, of course, with other people. But often the Italian uh, community would gather together. We'd go to church together. Of course, Christmas would be celebrated together and Easter, friends' houses. We had baptisms and we had weddings and we had funerals and many other sort of events in the, in the Italian community in Jasper, Alberta. And my memory dropped into one particular f uh, Italian family that we knew as a family. And, uh, you know, we would spend numerous occasions at their house and other places and I remember us kids would be there at the house with their kids and uh, we would do what kids do together. Um, so it was always a very Italian thing when we got together. You know from the heated discussions Italians around the table never just talk one at a time they're they're all over the map on that you know everyone talking at one time and and somehow it all makes sense and the food was tremendous the pasta, pasta the polenta the fagioli and the desert desserts were just phenomenal. But yet, my friends, not all was well with this family. Years later, years gone by, all of us kids had grown up and uh, we left the family home to other adventures. Years later, even that, I found out that the mother of that house uh, was in the local extended care facility suffering with Alzheimer's. And the husband, well, he was just plain arrogant. Going about bragging about his wealth and all the trappings of his wealth. And it seems that he succeeded very well with money over the years, but yet he alienated his family from him. They wanted nothing to do with their dad, even to this day, I would suspect, as adults. And sadly, he even ignored his own wife while he spent his time bragging and being arrogant about his, uh, his, his wealth. So where is he today? Well, a couple of years ago, as I usually do when I go by Jasper, if I stay there, I go to the Jasper Cemetery because that's where my, my dad, my mom, and my brother are buried. And one time I was there, I made my way to the gravesite. I noticed the gravestone of this particular gentleman that I'm talking about from town, the rich man who loved money so much he alienated his family, who ignored his wife in her last days. Question is, where's his money? Where's his cars? Where's his trips? I wondered as I went there, where he ended up when I walked by his grave. Paul said to the rich believers in the Ephesian church, rich believers now, 
Don't be arrogant. Don't put your trust in your wealth. Wealth, as the psalmist said, will surely sprout wings and fly off to the sky like an eagle. Put your hope in God who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. That's what he says right here in our text today. In chapter 12 of Romans, Paul said to the Roman church, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. And friends, it's out of this true and proper worship which manifests a humble heart and a humble service to the church and those around us. For Paul would say in that very same letter, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment. In accordance to the faith, God has distributed to each of you. So it's this kind of attitude of sacrifice to God and to others that the true believer demonstrates really what is called, what we can call love in action. Again, back to the Roman letter where Paul would say, would say, love must be sincere, hate what is evil, cling to what is good, be devoted to one another in love, honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. See, in our text, the rich believer is exhorted, as he is today in our time, to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. And in doing so, the true believer, the rich true believer, will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age, so that he may take hold of the life that is truly life. Question is, what is life that is truly life? Well, let's go to verse 12 of chapter 6. Paul said, fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called when you made your good confession. Folks, we the haves, the haves in our world today would do well to heed the apostles' instructions to do good, to be rich in good deeds, to be generous, and to be willing to share with others. Well, now we're back at uh, at the end of this letter here. We're at the end of this letter, I mean, pardon me, verse 20 and 21. And I think before we just sort of wrap it all up, I I want us to take a quick look at Matthew's Gospel, chapter 22. We know that Jesus in this last week, um, we would call the Holy Week, often we call that, prior to his crucifixion, uh, he spent a considerable amount of time teaching in the temple courts. And he was just hours from his arrest of death when one of the teachers of Israel, uh, a Pharisee, asked Jesus this, Teacher, What is the greatest commandment in the law? Well, Jesus answered, answered, and it summarizes for us, all true believers, the reason to get out of bed in the morning and to carry on. Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. So Jesus summarized the Ten Commandments, the 619 or nine laws for the people of Israel into these, into these two commandments. This is why we get out of bed in the morning. If you're a rich believer, you get out of bed because you love the Lord your God with all your heart. If you're not a rich believer, same thing. And you love your neighbor. You serve your neighbor. It doesn't matter if they're Christian or not. It could be Muslim. It could be anything. You serve them. Because all of the law, that's all of the law and the prophets, the Old Testament and the New Testament, hang on these two commandments. See, we have our last contrast here, don't we? We take what Jesus said as our, our way to live life, our moda, modus operandi. Or why? And like Timothy, we are to what? Guard what has been entrusted to our care. Here the emphasis is so strong and forceful. We guard, we watch, we keep. What do we keep? What do we guard? What do we watch? Well, the apostolic teachings that we have here in the New Testament. 
The gospel of Jesus Christ, the pure, unadulterated gospel, not Jesus plus something else. Jesus Christ only. Eternal life, we take hold of that. We run that race to win that prize. The greatest commandment. We, we guard, we watch, we keep God's truth as revealed to us in his Bible, not by someone's opinion. We're to guard against all that is godless, all that is profane and chatter of our day and our culture. We, we, we guard and watch against all opposing ideas that come against God's truth. And that includes those opposing ideas that we find in the church from people. We guard, we keep, we watch for those who profess to be teachers of God's truth, yet present what is falsely called knowledge. Many are preaching, hey, God told me this, and you don't know this, so I'm going to tell you that. If it doesn't line up with here, it's not from God, okay, folks? Well, at the very end, here's this beautiful phrase, grace be with you all. Here, you know, he signs off, Paul signs off, not just for Timothy, but for everybody. This is a plural you. Paul was not only commanding Timothy to guard the truth, he was commanding all believers in the Ephesian church to guard the truth. He's, the Bible of God is commanding us to guard the truth. Well, the Bible really does challenge us today, doesn't it? As we start to wrap this up here in two seconds here, this one question, what is the church? And I want to close this uh, sermon and this series by reading from that article that Marshall Seagal was talking about the pillar of truth, the church, the pillar of truth. And it's a, a challenge to you and to me and to the church of Jesus Christ. Seagal says this, God has made the church the pillar of truth. So does it serve that purpose in your life, in the life of your church? If not, if you're not sure, you, you might begin by asking what drew you to your current church and what keeps you there? Has your time in the church deepened your understanding and enjoyment of God's word? Is it the church that loves to hear from God in the Bible? Even when, even what he says, even when, pardon me, what he says is confusing, uncomfortable, or convicting. Do the gatherings gladly lead with the truth or with music and humor and an atmosphere that softens the harder edges of the truth? Does your church constantly shy away from beliefs and verses that the world hates? On sin and hell, on sexuality, marriage and abortion, on race and justice, on the sovereignty of God, on election, on the cross? Or does your church have a manifest and growing love for the truth? And then even more personally, how are you contributing to your church's pillarness or not? Are you thin and an unreliable gusset plate waiting to break? Or do you intentionally devote yourself week in and week out to the truth? Are you currently seeking to grow in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ? God strengthens the pillar of the church by building and fortifying individual churches. And he strengthens individual churches by building and fortifying individual souls. Souls like yours. He steeps each of us in truth through his word and fellowship with truth lovers. So the church stands firm in every age and circumstance. The pillar doesn't rise or fall just with preachers, but with ordinary people in ordinary pews, filled and overflowing with the truth. Let us pray. Almighty God, we thank you. Now as we draw this message to a close, this series to a close, this letter to a close, we, may we never forget what you have taught us about yourself, your encouragement, your challenge, the changes that we've had to do in our lives and the changes we will do in our lives, I pray that we would all do it with courage and trust you with it. We thank you now, Lord. I thank you for everyone watching or listening to this particular message. Bless them on this Father's Day. Thank you, fathers, for what you do for your families and for the communities in this world. We need strong fathers, Lord. Help us with that. And we thank you for all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thank you very much for having me with you. Uh, God bless. Uh, shalom.